All right, we're starting chapter 25. Uh, we're going to cover the first couple sections of the chapter on capacitance. All right, so two conductors uh, shown here and here, uh, isolated electrically from each other and from their surroundings form a capacitor. All right, so they're not t physically touching um, and they're isolated from their surroundings as well. So two conductors form a capacitor. When the capacitor is charged, the charges on the conductors, or the plates as they're generally called, um, have the same magnitude Q but opposite signs. All right, so when we're talking about conductors, they're going to have the same magnitude of charge, but one's going to be positive and one's going to be negative. And looking at the electric field, we can see uh, the sort of pattern that occurs in between, which is what we do, would expect with the electric field due to a dipole. Uh, okay, so when a capacitor is charged, its plates have charges of equal magnitudes but opposite signs, like we said. However, we refer to the charge of a capacitor as being Q, right, just Q. So the absolute value of these charges um, on the plates, right, so it's not the, the absolute values added together, it's just um, basically what the magnitude of one plate of charge is going to be. All right, so the charge Q and the potential difference V for a capacitor are proportional to each other. All right, so that's given by this equation, where C is going to be some constant um, that depends on the geometry, and uh, we call that capacitance. Sorry, so C is going to be capacitance, and it's important to note that, again, that the value only depends on the geometry of the plates. It has nothing to do um, with the charge or the potential difference. Okay, um, the SI unit is called the farad, and we're going to use capital F as the unit for that, and that's equal to one coulomb per volt. Right, so if you take this equation, you rearrange it for C, you see that uh, a capacitance or a farad is going to be charge which is going to be in coulombs divided by the uh, potential which is in volts. Alright, so the, so the circuit shown is incomplete uh, because of the switch S is open. That is, the switch does not electrically connect the wires that attach to it. All right, so um, in this chapter, we're going to start using this sort of form to, uh, to show what circuits are. Um, real quickly, you have the battery shown with uh, a double line, one, one longer than the other. The longer one is going to be um, the positive side, and the shorter one is going to be the negative side. Sometimes you'll see it drawn like this, where you have um, two sets of this, um, where this is the positive and this is the negative. Uh, in either way is fine. Um, we're looking at the potential difference between two points, so the potential difference between two sides of the battery, you have the positive side and the negative side. Um, this is going to be what a capacitor looks like. All right, It's just going to be two straight even lines with some space in between them. And then you have a switch that's generally shown like this. When it's in the open position, it'll look like that. If it's in the closed position, it'll just look like this. Um, so again, when the switch is closed, electrically connecting those wires, the circuit is complete, and then the charge we, uh, then can flow um, through the switch and the wires. All right, so as the plates become positively charged, that potential difference increases until it equals the potential difference, V, between the terminals of the battery. All right, so when you close this switch, you're going to have charge flowing uh, to the capacitor. Right, from the positive and the negative side, and you're going to end up with some positive charge and some negative charge, so you basically charge the capacitor. Um, it's going to charge until the potential difference of the capacitor is the same as the potential difference of the battery. Right, with the electric field zero, there's no further drive of, the, of electrons. So once this capacitor gets charged, it's going to um, it's going to n not have, it's, it's going to basically stop the flow of electricity in the circuit, all right, once you charge the, the capacitor, because there's nowhere for the charge to go.
right? If, if you fully charge a capacitor, um, then there's nowhere for that charge to go. Now the capacitor is then said to be fully charged with a potential difference V and a charge Q. Right, so again, the potential difference in this case is just going to be whatever the potential of the uh, battery is, and then the charge, uh, uh, some charge Q. All right, so how do we calculate the capacitance? Well, to relate the uh, electric field E between the plates of a capacitor, we're going to have to use Gauss's law, and we want to, we want to relate that to the charge on either plate. Um, so using Gauss's law, we create our Gaussian surface, which is shown over here. It's just a dotted red line, where part of the Gaussian surface is running through the center of the capacitor, uh, excuse, uh, of the parallel plate, and then the other is going through the electric field that's between the two plates. All right, so using Gauss's law, um, here Q is going to be the charge enclosed by Gaussian surface, and the integral of E dot dA is just the net flux, um, the electric flux through the surface. Now, in our special case in the figure, we can just say that Q is equal to epsilon naught E A because of the symmetry, in which A is the area of that part of the Gaussian surface through which the um, to which there is flux. So if we look at our Gaussian surface, this is the only part of the surface that has flux through it, and it's going to be a constant electric field. So this E becomes constant. Dot product, so we're going to use cosine theta. Um, that's going to just be... Uh, be 1 because the dA element is in the same direction as um, our area element. Excuse me, the dA element is, is um, in the same direction as our electric field. Um, so since it's in the same direction, the cosine of the angle between them is cosine 0, so that would be 1. Um, okay, so and then the area is just going to be whatever uh, the area of the, of the plate is. All right, so this simplifies to just epsilon naught EA. Um, so the potential difference between the plates of a capacitor is then related uh, to the electric field, like we've seen in last, uh, in last chapter. So the potential difference is just going to be our uh, negative integral E dot dS. Now if V is the difference between, uh, or is, is our present potential difference, so if we use V as our potential difference, we can just say that um, the integral from the negative to the positive is E dS. And our bounds are going to be from one plate to the other, so the distance between the two plates, since we're taking the integral of a dS, and the electric field doesn't change. All right, so this would be our zero point and then all the way to D, so those are the bounds of integration. When you do that, you find that it's the uh, potential difference is just E dot D, or E D, excuse me. So if we take the two equations that we just found, this one here and this one here, we can see what the capacitance is. So we know our equation for capacitance is just the capacitance is equal to the charge divided by the potential difference. We plug in, whoops, we plug in what we found for our charge up here through Gauss's law. So that's just going to be epsilon naught times the electric field times A and divide that by what we found for our potential difference, which is just V is equal to E D. Simplifying this, the E's cancel out. So you see that our capacitance is just equal to epsilon naught times the area divided by distance. This is going to be the capacitance for a parallel plate capacitor. All right. Well, there's not just parallel plates, of course. What if we had a cylindrical capacitor? All right, so for this Gaussian surface, we're going to choose a cylinder of length L and a radius R, closed by end caps, and then placed as shown. All right, so here is our two concentric cylinders. We picked a Gaussian surface inside here, as you can see. And it's going to have some length L um, with some radius R out to it. Now, uh, it's going to be coaxial with the cylinders, and it encloses the central cylinder, and thus also the charge Q on that cylinder. So it also encloses this charge. All right, so I, we start again with our uh, result from Gauss's law. Oops. So our charge is equal to uh, epsilon naught times the electric field times A. And we can do this because... The electric field is again constant when we're looking at this surface. The electric field is going to be constant all the way around it. 
Um, and then the area element is just whatever area we happen to be using. So in this case, we're, we're talking about a, um, a cylindrical area because it's this extends back into the page. All right, so this is just going to be epsilon naught times the electric field times the area of a cylinder, which is just 2 pi r, which is the circumference, times L, which extends it all the way back. All right, so that's what we have for charge. Now, if we wanted to solve this for electric field, we would see that the electric field is just Q over 2 pi epsilon naught LR. Now, we also need to find the voltage. So the potential difference, again, is just this integral, E ds, which is equal to minus q over 2 pi epsilon naught times the integral. Oops, this is, there is an L in here. Right, because we're, we're taking this E that we found up here and plugging it in here and then taking the integral. We're going to say it's from B to A dr over R. So we have this one R, and that's going to be the only thing that's actually changing. That's going to be the variable. Now, why do we pick from B to A? Well, uh, over here, our integral says it's from the negative to the positive charge. So if we look at from the negative, which is B away, to the positive, which is A away. All right, so you're basically integrating throughout this middle section here. All right, um, so we go, ahead, we go ahead and do the integral of 1 over r, and we know that's just going to be the natural log of r. So let's go ahead and say that Oops, you get minus uh, q over 2 pi epsilon naught times the natural log of a minus the natural log of b. And we have this negative out front, so let's go ahead and get rid of that. We'll distribute it through both of these terms, and we'll simplify. And when you do that, you get uh, the potential is going to just be q 2 pi epsilon naught times the natural log of b divided by a. Right, because if you distribute the negative through, now you have a negative uh, a and a positive b. So the natural log of something minus natural log of something is just the natural log of the first divided by the natural log of the second. All right, so we have the natural log of b over a. Now, if I wanted to then find the capacitance, I would go ahead and use our equation for capacitance. So we plug in what we found for q up here, and we plug in what we found... Um, for V down here, and we end up getting 2 pi epsilon naught L divided by the natural log of B over A after some simplification. All right, so this is going to be the capacitance of a cylindrical capacitor. Okay. All right, and then next we want to see what the um, what the capacitance of a spherical capacitor is. All right, so again, very similarly, we're going to set up the same way. We have our result from Gauss's law, which is just Q is equal to EA. This time, uh, excuse me, epsilon naught EA. This time, our area for a cube is going to be 4 pi r squared, right, because we're choosing, uh, it looks very similar, but we're choosing now a spherical uh, Gaussian surface in the middle here, so we need the area of the surface of a sphere, which is just 4 pi r squared. The electric field is simply going to be 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught times q over r squared, which you could have found with this equation, um, or we know that the um, the electric field due to a spherical conductor is just going to look like a point charge. 
right? So it's the same equation for the electric field of a point charge. Now, if we find the uh, potential difference, again, we have from negative to positive EDS, this is going to be equal to negative Q divided by 4 pi epsilon naught. Right, we're just plugging in our electric field and taking the integral from B to A. And now we have dr over r squared. All right, so when we take this integral, we're going to end up with, uh, let's see, Q over 4 pi epsilon naught. And that's just going to be 1 over A minus 1 over B. If I wanted to simplify this and get a common denominator, I could just multiply each by the um, by a over, or excuse me, this first one by b over b, this one by a over a, and that would simplify to q over four pi epsilon naught b minus a divided by a b. Now again, if I wanted to find what the capacitance is at this point, um, I want to use the equation of capacitance. It's equal to q over v. So I plug in what I found for q up here what I found for V down here, and a bunch of stuff cancels. I end up with, oops, I end up with 4 pi epsilon naught AB over B minus A. And this is going to be the capacitance for a spherical, oops, for a spherical capacitor. Okay. All right, so the last topic, um, calculating the capacitance uh, of an isolated sphere. So we can as assign a capacitance to a single isolated sphere conductor of radius r by assuming that the missing plate is actually a conducting sphere that's of infinite radius, so infinite far away. The field lines that leave the surface of this positively charged isolated conductor must end somewhere. Um, so the walls of the room in which the conductor is housed can serve effectively as our sphere of infinite radius. So to find the capacitance of such a conductor, we first rewrite the, capac the capacitance as uh, 4 pi epsilon naught um, a over 1 minus a over b. So this was just taking the equation that we found last time, doing a little bit of algebraic manipulation, and we end up with this. All right, so now let's look at this equation and let b go to infinity. All right, so b, if you remember, was the distance to that outer capacitor. So if it's at infinity, if b goes to infinity, then this term by itself just gets really, really small and goes to zero. And substituting in R, big R, for A, we end up with this simple equation. So this just really ends up being 1 minus 0, so it's just everything over 1. Replace A with R, and you get the capacitance is 4 pi epsilon naught times the radius. So this is going to be for an isolated sphere. All right, that's all we're going to cover uh, in this lecture. Next time, we're going to do some example problems and uh, move on in the chapter.